All right. You ready? I am 47 years old. I live in Amesbury, Massachusetts with my husband, Owen, and our son, Jackson, and we have two dogs. I work full-time as a marketing consultant, and I'm also a part-time yoga instructor. You're gonna teach them tricks like at Canopy Lake? We spend a lot of time locally at the beach and in the mountains. We live kind of equidistant to both, so it's a fun place to live. Throw it, Jackson, throw it. My son, Jackson, who is adopted, we adopted him at three and a half years old. He's now six and a half, and he's just the most amazing little kid in the world. Laura is probably one of the most warmest nice. and welcoming people that I've ever met. That was one of my first impressions of her on our first date, is that everything just felt very natural, and that she was easy to talk to. In the spring of 2001, I was 24 years old at the time, I started to have really bad abdominal pain and didn't really know what it was from. After a couple of days of trying to treat it with just over-the-counter medication, I spiked a fever. And so I ended up going to the emergency room. My name is Laura, and I have acute intermittent porphyria, or AIP. They immediately thought it was appendicitis and rushed me in for surgery. I went in for my follow-up appointment for the appendicitis, and the surgeon told me that they had removed a healthy appendix, so they hadn't gotten uh, what was causing the pain. At that point in time, I was in the hospital for about five and a half weeks. Fortunately, my paternal grandmother was still alive at the time, and she called my father and said, have you had them test for porphyria? And they came into my hospital room with a textbook and opened it up to the page that said porphyria and just read aloud to me what it said there. So many of the things just tick, tick, tick um, hit uh, to my symptoms. Acute intermittent porphyria is one disease in a family of conditions called porphyria, and these all affect heme synthesis, which is part of hemoglobin. It's what carries oxygen on red blood cells. And in AIP, certain neurotoxic substances accumulate that can cause intermittent and sometimes chronic symptoms of abdominal pain, weakness, seizures, high heart rate, and other symptoms as well. I never knew growing up that my grandmother had AIP. It was never talked about. She was told at the time, the medical knowledge was that she couldn't pass it to a male child. My father was an only child, and so they just assumed that the genetic history of porphyria had ended with him. If you have a parent with the AIP gene, you yourself have a 50% chance of acquiring that gene. About one in 2,000 people in a European database will have the gene, but it's very, the penetrance varies. And only about 10% of patients who have the genetic mutation will actually have symptoms of AIP. Um, I learned it pretty early on in our relationship. She had mentioned that she had an acute illness. She shared the story of her first hospitalization, uh, the story of the doctors thinking that it was appendicitis. I'd never seen her have an actual porphyria attack. I didn't really understand what we were dealing with until a couple of years after we met. I was really um, unsettled and I guess relieved when we found the answer, but also just confused because I had no idea what this was. Typically we use genetic testing and biochemical testing together for diagnosis. AIP attack technically refers to one of those acute episodes usually of severe abdominal pain that can bring somebody either into the clinic for treatment or into the hospital for treatment, severe nausea, vomiting, other GI distress can lead to seizures. To diagnose an acute porphyria attack, patients have to have elevated urine levels of porphyrinogen, one of the toxic substances that builds up in the blood. So that's the main test for diagnosis. Sometimes people can have normal levels of porphyrinogen between attacks, and it may only be very elevated during an attack. So that can make it a bit complicated for diagnosis. I've had patients describe to me more mild symptoms that herald 
an acute attack if those symptoms aren't sort of nipped in the bud. But we try again to treat them before they reach that threshold. And patients often describe brain fog, uh, difficulty concentrating, disruption in sleep, um, GI side effects. And for each patient, the symptoms are so classic, so characteristic. And you can ask a patient, is your abdominal pain, are your symptoms right now, are they, are they a porphyria flare? And they will know. It is so unique and characteristic for every patient. When I first saw Laura experiencing symptoms, it was heartbreaking, it was distressing, uh, it was confusing. It was a little over a month before our wedding in 2012. And she'd been experiencing a migraine for several days. And on the fourth day, she started experiencing symptoms. And it was then that she really opened up and said, I, I think I might be in the early stages of an attack. Uh, she gave it a few hours and uh, eventually she came up to me. I was sitting watching TV and she was sobbing, doubled over in pain. She said, I need to go to the hospital. If it goes unchecked and you have an acute attack uh, for a while, it can even lead to respiratory paralysis or permanent paralysis. Here in our clinic uh, with Dr. Dickey, we really try to keep patients out of the hospital unless they really need to go in. We saw that there was a need for porphyria patients to have a medical home where they can get comprehensive care for porphyria. There is no cure for acute porphyria at this time, but there are several treatments that are effective. So we have patients who have had one lifetime acute attack and then have never had an attack again. We have patients who have had a couple of attacks during their lifetime. And then we have patients who are having chronic daily symptoms and frequent attacks, multiple, multiple attacks, and they're in and out of the hospital all the time. So there's a huge spectrum uh, in terms of how patients are affected. My last attack was actually just this past June and I was able to manage it um, via outpatient infusions. And so I was able to just go to the infusion clinic four days in a row and go home at night, which is a huge coup, major improvement. Okay, this is for the stage ones. Uh. It can cause big strain for patients emotionally and also cause a strain on families and family relationships just because of how hard it can be to manage porphyria and to get through life with porphyria. What I came to find out is the better I treated my body and the healthier I kept myself, meaning good nutrition, staying strong uh, physically and getting enough sleep, then the more I would avoid attacks, the fewer attacks I would have, and also the easier it was to recover from an attack. It doesn't just leave me impressed, it, it, it inspires me when if I have things going on for me personally that are kind of dragging me down, uh, I think of Lauren, I think of the way she um, just, you know, powers through life and, and strives always to look at the bright side. When I was in the early years of my diagnosis, I was in recovery or I was sick and couldn't really find my footing and maintain a fitness routine. A friend of mine suggested that I take a yoga class from a specific instructor that um, she knew about. And I just, I went to this class and I immediately like fell in love. So traditionally when I teach, I teach at a yoga studio, but when I'm practicing on my own, I love to be in nature. This park here, Batchelder Park, at the top of the hill in my neighborhood, is one of my favorite places to come. And then I'm appreciative of the efforts that are being made to bring more awareness to this disease. And that hopefully this is great momentum to start discovering more treatment options. And who knows, maybe one day there is a cure. Laura's doing very well. Um, I think that we've come up with a plan that if she's having the start of an attack, the start of symptoms, that uh, she'll get in touch with me as soon as possible and we can get her into the clinic and give her, give her treatment as soon as possible.
glad that people are able to hear Laura's story because I think with uh, rare disease, people may look normal on the outside and they may not understand the challenges underneath. We need to make it bigger but also up. All right. Like, it's important for us to have the people around us acknowledge that it exists because on a day-to-day -day basis, when you're just trying to live your life, it's still present. I still have the, the brain fog. I still have the pain. And I don't want to parade. I don't want you know people to have to constantly be managing me. But it is it is important that people recognize it and see it despite its invisibility. Ishvara Pranidhana is my tattoo here. It means surrender to oneself. It's a yoga philosophy and the one that rings true for me, especially yeah battling this condition, you always sort of have to surrender to what's true and what your highest power is. <laughs>